welcome back everyone. As I explained in the introductory video, the relationship between race and crime, it is kind of a complicated. Uh, in this video, I'm going to explain some of these uh, complications uh, in the study of race and crime. And pretty much everything that I'm going to explain here uh, is uh, basically uh, related to the videos that are assigned to this, uh, to this week of the course or the readings that I assign in the either the required or uh, uh, the recommended list. So you can pretty much uh, explore uh, these topics by looking at the readings and videos assigned to this week. So uh, the objectives for this week would be um, basically understanding some of these complications and challenges associated with the studying race and crime. Uh, basically also explaining the sources and causes of racial disparity in the justice system, as well as describing how social and structural factors as well as, well as criminal justice actors' decision-making uh, might put racial minorities at, at significant disadvantage, also known as cumulative disadvantage. So uh, the topics that uh, I'm hoping I can, be, uh, I, can, I can cover in this presentation would be uh, the issues associated with, uh, or the limitation associated with official data, uh, the importance of considering the race combination with sex and age when we want to um, investigate the, the impact of race uh, in the justice system. Uh, cumulative disadvantage, basically uh, explaining how decision made uh, uh, in the earlier stage of the criminal justice system process could affect uh, the later stages. Uh, sources and causes of disparities, uh, whether they are systematic, uh, that, uh, that might be considered as discrimination or non-systematic, that might be related to stereotyping. And finally, uh, social structural disadvantage. Uh, so let's just start with the problem with data. So pretty much everything that we, we would like to study, any topic in any field, we uh, are always looking for uh, good quality data. If we do not have a good quality data, uh, uh, what we find in the study might not really reflect on um, what is actually going on in the world. So in order to have a realistic uh, understanding about any topic, in this case being race and crime, we need to have valid and reliable uh, data. So uh, pretty much everything that we, we know from the media or news about uh, crime rise or decline in the United States come from official data. Uh, the a major criminal, uh, sorry, a major uh, crime data or official crime data in the United States is Uniform Crime Report, uh, which is basically uh, crime reports uh, by uh, law enforcement agencies across the country to the, to the FBI. And FBI basically publishes this annual report uh, uh, named crime in the United States. So there's, there are certain limitations uh, associated with uh, a uniform crime report that uh, is going to, uh, to affect our understanding about uh, crime um, and its relationship with race. So uh, currently, some of these limitations are being addressed uh, because uh, UCR, uh, which is Uniform Crime Report, uh, uh, basically is transitioning to what is called NIBRS, which is the National Incidence-Based Reporting System. Um, and, but uh, pretty much everything that we know today about the impact of a race on crime comes from the from the UCR, which is the older version of the uh, of NIBRS. However, there are, because of these limitations that I'm going to explain a little bit more uh, in the next slide, um, we rely on other data sources such as self-report data, uh, which is basically asking individuals to report their uh, engagement in crime. So self-report data is not an official data source. Uh, other data sources also include National Crime Victimization Survey, which basically helps us to get a, uh, get a better understanding about uh, crime pictures and trends in the United States. 
So what are these limitations associated with official data that are important for our, our purpose? So uh, there are many, many limitations, but here I'm focusing on uh, only uh, two or four of them that are directly related to uh, our, uh, our topic of this week. So the, the a major problem is that we do not have a, a valid way of uh, categorizing individuals based on their race or ethnicity. So for example, in many of the criminal justice uh, agencies, we see that uh, the race and ethnicity is being categorized as white versus non-white which of course is going to be very uh, complicated. For example, if you uh, asking someone about their race or ethnicity, uh, who might be a Middle Eastern or uh, uh, basically other ethnicities that might not be considered themselves as, uh, as white. Uh, we know that, for example, Middle Easterns are being categorized as, as white or Caucasian. Uh, however, the, the whole purpose of categorizing individuals based on their race and ethnicity is uh, uh, reflecting on their cultural background, the understanding uh, how their experience in the society may have been different from other, other racial or ethnic categories. So uh, this, this is going to create substantial problem because if you look, look into official data, for example, for 15 years ago, we see that uh, Hispanics are pretty much being categorized uh, similar to whites. So whites and Hispan Hispanics are being categorized as one race or ethnicity. And uh, because uh, we know from uh, some studies that Hispanics are more likely, for example, to be arrested uh, compared to whites. So combining Hispanics and whites is going to really uh, close the gap uh, if you are interested to study Blacks and whites, right? Because we are now we are now not comparing blacks and whites. We are comparing blacks and the other category being white and Hispanics combined. So this is going to really uh, understate the real extent of racial disparity in arrest. This is of course only one example. Uh, so race of the victims also is going to matter, especially in capital cases. We know uh, in capital cases race of uh, a victim matters. For example, if uh, we are talking about uh, violent crimes, uh, we know from research that uh, individuals, uh, for example, African-Americans, uh, uh, basically uh, committing crime against uh, whites are uh, basically more likely to receive harsher sentences. Uh, but uh, many of the official data do not have a clear uh, um, data or uh, clear information on the victims of a uh, crime when it's reported to the to the FBI. So in many instances, this this uh, uh, inf this information is uh, is missing in official data uh, or has not been categorized properly. Uh, another limitation uh, would be that the crime is basically uh, filtered through the police. So. Uh, this is an advantage because uh, um, data being filtered through the police meaning that uh, means that uh, the <clears throat> the data uh, are uh, verified by police. So perhaps would be our most reliable source of information about street uh, crimes and more violent crimes. But this is also an uh, also a limitation because. Uh, this could really reflect on uh, the police uh, officer's uh, discretion and how they basically going to decide whether or not to make an arrest. So, uh, another limitation of official data would be dark figure of crime. Uh, the, the dark figure of crime are crimes that have not been reported to the police or the crimes that is not known to the police. So. Uh, if you look at this, this picture, which is uh, referred to as the criminal justice funnel, if you look at this funnel, you see that at the top of the funnel, we see crime, which is basically crime that happens in the United States every day, right? And all of those crimes that happen in the United States, only a small proportion is reported to the police. And of those, a small proportion leads to arrest. So uh, not all crimes that happen in the United States 
uh, is basically known to the police. Uh, bottom of the funnel, we see that of, of those arrested, a small proportion uh, might lead to prosecution and of those the smaller to conviction and finally prison. So we, when we look at the very last stage, which is prison or incarceration, we know African-Americans are about seven times uh, more likely than whites to be incarcerated. But when we look at the top of the uh, top of the funnel, which would be crime reported to the, uh, not reported to the police, but uh, crime that are not known to the police, we see that the, the gap between uh, whites and racial minorities is much, much narrower. Uh, so this means that uh, it's possible that uh, uh, the criminal justice system actors' decision-making uh, work in disadvantage of racial minorities, because if the gap uh, at the bottom of the funnel is substantially different uh, than the, the um, gap uh, at the top of the funnel that might be related to the system's uh, uh, performance and uh, decision making. So uh, how do we know about the crime reported, uh, sorry, crime that is not reported to the police, uh, that the gap is not at large, is through the, the self-report data or uh, National Crime Victimization Survey, which are uh, two different data sources that we use to get, a, uh, get an estimate on uh, the dark figure of crime. So uh, these are limitations associated with uh, official data, uh, specifically uh, the categorization of individuals based on their race or ethnicity, and also some of the um, limitation that is perhaps related to the mechanism and how the system works and the discretion of the criminal justice system actors. But what do we know from, from all this data and special official data? So we know that racial minorities are overrepresented in the justice system. This includes the juvenile justice system as well as the criminal justice system. So uh, what, what are the possible sources of disparity? Uh, this disparity, uh, which simply is uh, different, could be related to differential involvement, meaning that racial minorities are uh, perhaps uh, <clears throat> more likely to, to be involved uh, or engage on social or criminal behavior. Uh, uh, but it could also be related to differential treatment, such as discrimination, uh, which would be more of a systematic uh, 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 differences and also a stereotyping. So we are going to explore this a little bit further, uh, but it is important to, to note that uh, these uh, sources of disparity could really uh, affect, uh, um, could be really affected by the way that the system basically processes cases as well. So um, what are the differences between disparity and discrimination? So disparity refers to a difference uh, but uh, one that does not necessarily involve discrimination. So uh, if you think about it in terms of legal factors and extra legal factors, legal factors relate to things that should really matter, uh, should really matter in terms of um, uh, deciding the case, right? Uh, this includes the seriousness of offense, for example, or prior records. So if a, a crime is serious or involves someone who has committed several crimes, then uh, we would expect that the le these legal factors would uh, basically affect the case outcome, and that would be the differential involvement. However, uh, there might be some uh, signs that extra legal factors also are determinants of the case outcome. Extra legal factors include things like race or, or uh, gender. So uh, extra legal factors should not really affect the case outcome. Uh, if there is, a, there is an evidence to show that extra legal factors matter and they, they do impact the, the outcome of the case, then we can conclude that there is a differential treatment in the system, whether it is based on conscious or unconscious biases. Uh, and then this is, of course, would be the, the definition of discrimination that uh, different types of individuals uh, are being treated differently uh, compared to others. So not that the discrimination and disparity and the distinction between the two is hopefully clear. Uh, let's look at some of the, uh, some of the uh, 
examples of uh, systematic uh, discrimination that might be uh, related to, uh, to, to the matter of race. So there are many examples of this, including zero tolerance pol uh, policing, uh, uh, as well as uh, zero, zero tolerance policies in the school that is also known as uh, a school to prison pipeline. <clears throat> But I'm here, here I'm explaining only uh, a few of them. So as you probably know, uh, during 1980s and 1990s, uh, the United States criminal justice system basically started uh, this uh, top on crime policies and war on drugs being part of that. And uh, racial minorities uh, have been uh, disproportionately affected by these uh, laws and policies. For example, uh, uh, the mandatory minimum sentencing is really reducing the judge's discretion uh, in, um, <clears throat> in uh, decision making for, uh, for sentencing and basically uh, ask for harsh sentences for, for people who commit certain type of crime. Uh, many of these could be related to drug offenses during the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, another um, Example of this would be three strikes and your odds laws, which would be if you have two felony conviction, for example, the third one, you will receive very harsh sentences. Again, many of these uh, offenses um, might be related to drugs or it might not really be violent, uh, violent offenses, but they are in the, in the prior record of those who might be uh, <clears throat> more categorized as racial minorities. And by racial minorities, uh, I'm mainly in this presentation focusing on African-Americans and Hispanics. Uh, so uh, another classic example of this would be crack versus powder cocaine. And uh, the documentary 13th uh, that you may have watched, if not, I have assigned it to, to this week of the course, uh, does a great job kind of uh, <laughs> explaining this problem. There are certain, uh, there are several uh, theoretical frameworks that has been uh, has been provided uh, for explaining this uh, sentencing disparity between uh, crack cocaine and powder cocaine. So crack cocaine is typically known, or uh, it's, it's typically known as a as a, as a street drug, whereas powder cocaine is is known as a as a uh, part drug that is typically used by uh, by white and uh, middle class, whereas the crack cocaine is typically used by working class and is known as a, as a street drug. So the sentencing disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine, even though the two have very similar chemical components, uh, is, is substantial. So it was one to 100. So uh, you, you needed to have 100 grams of, uh, sorry, for, for example, if you have 500 grams of powder cocaine, you would receive a similar sentence to someone who has uh, five grams of crack cocaine. Uh, so this uh, ratio, this uh, sentencing disparity uh, was reduced to one to 18 ratio uh, uh, during the during Obama administration. However, uh, the, the gap is still there and is affecting racial minorities significantly uh, because again, uh, crack cocaine is, uh, tend to be used by, um, uh, by uh, working class and racial minorities compared to powder cocaine, which is known as a party drug or uh, used more often by, by middle class. So uh, another example of this would be uh, bail, bail policies, which kind of shows you that not all this discrimination that we're talking about are uh, basically maybe directly uh, affecting uh, racial minorities, but it kind of, uh, set the stage for uh, influencing um, a certain group of individuals more than others. For example, granting pretrial release to defendants uh, <clears throat> who are currently employed uh, is uh, a policy that is being used by, by many states. Okay, so if, you if you're employed, you are less likely to be detained because uh, unreasonably, right, uh, you might conclude that, so if you have, if someone has, uh, is employed is less likely to engage in crime because of higher stakes in the community. Uh, so um, the problem is um, this, this type of policy kind of discriminates against uh, people who are unemployed. 
And we know that racial minorities are disproportionately represented among the unemployed. Uh, so they're more likely to, to be denied bail. So uh, again, another short video that I assigned to this week of the uh, course is, is a description of a research by uh, Deva uh, Pager. Uh, she explains that uh, um, in order to receive a job uh, as, as a racial minority or as African-American, you need to be twice as good as a white person to, to uh, secure a job. Uh, in fact, she showed in her research that uh, racial minority with no criminal record are almost as equally likely to to secure a job as some uh, as as a white person with a prior uh, conviction. So uh, it shows that not everything that we talk about uh, is uh, limited to the criminal justice system. Uh, um, um, performance, okay, or uh, discretion. Many of these problems start out of, out of system. Many of these uh, problems might be related to, to uh, the society as a whole. And uh, my, my colleagues at the Northern University did a great job explaining some of these social differences and, uh, for example, disparity in uh, health or uh, economic system uh, or economy. So uh, once you are denied bill, uh, you are more likely to be detained. So we know from uh, uh, research that people who are uh, detained are also more likely to be convicted uh, because uh, detention typically happens because the risk for uh, not uh, coming to the court is high or that, uh, you know, that the person uh, is believed to uh, basically pose a serious threat to public safety. So when you are denied bail, you're more likely to be detained and you're more likely to be convicted. Again, disproportionately affecting racial minorities. So uh, now let's go back and look into some of the things that might, not, might be related to non-systematic um, discrimination or uh, differential in treatment of certain individuals. And that might be more relevant to criminal justice system. Study basically focused on uh, judicial decision making in sentencing. Okay, so uh, the authors of this study were interested to uh, to understand the impact of uh, race, uh, uh, sex, uh, and age, uh, and they found evidence that all these factors are important in uh, influencing the sen sentencing outcome in a criminal case. However, when they uh, consider the combined effect of these three components, providing some evidence that being a, a young African-American male is a costly combination when it comes to the contact with the justice system. Uh, so um, uh, importantly, they found that the legal factors that we talked about earlier, such as prior record uh, or a seriousness of offense, played a significant role in deciding uh, the sentencing outcome, but also extra legal factors uh, had a substantial uh, effect on uh, the, 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 the case outcome. So they also did some form of qualitative research and they basically, uh, as part of that qualitative research, they interviewed judges and they found that uh, many judges uh, perceived uh, this group of individuals, namely young African-American males as, as dangerous and less reformable which again goes back to the stereotyping. So the, the reality is that in many situations, judges do not have a very uh, comprehensive uh, information on the defendant's background. And when this happens, they tend to rely on the stereotyping because uh, the, uh, one of the major uh, considerations for uh, sentencing and also the uh, decision to uh, detain or not to detain a uh, person before trial, for example, would be based on uh, the threat that that individual might pose to the public safety. So uh, research shows that uh, judges uh, who uh, per, do not have enough information about the background of the, of the defendants, they might rely on the stereotyping. And unfortunately, this group of individuals, young African-American males, tend to be perceived as more dangerous and less reformable. Uh, thereby uh, thereby receiving harsher 
sentences uh, com uh, compared to any other combination. So this kind of shed light on the importance of not only considering race, because if the authors were only considering race, the, the, uh, the impact of race on uh, sentence outcomes would be modest. But when you, uh, when you consider the combined effect, in this case, being young African-American male with any other combinations, uh, they, they are a significant disadvantage. And this, this uh, patterns of the stereotyping uh, can be observed in other, other uh, segments of the system as well. So when, we, when I talk about segments, I'm referring to law enforcement, court, and corrections. So um, uh, one of the studies, for example, that I, uh, I assigned to this study explains that this, uh, how this might be uh, applicable to, to law enforcement and uh, in their treatment and in terms of uh, a stop and frisk, for example. The reality is that we are all somehow biased uh, towards certain individuals to some different degree, even though this might not be, uh, this might, might not sound very appealing. Uh, we are all somehow uh, biased, and uh, the criminal justice system actors are not immune of these uh, biases. And um, courses like these that we are having right now is really important to kind of educating uh, both professional and uh, uh, members of the community about these biases. And uh, this is going to hopefully help reduce these these problems. Uh, so. Uh, Another study basically uh, showed that uh, this perception of dangerousness that uh, many people might have toward a certain group of individuals uh, might translate to uh, uh, the fear of fear, uh, sorry, the feeling of fear uh, about the police or other criminal justice system actors. For example, one study found that most black respondents uh, live in fear of police killing them and hurting their family members. And this relationship was mediated or this perception was mediated or influenced by past experiences with police mistreatment. So this is a recently published study uh, and that uh, basically shows this uh, mistrust in police among uh, racial minorities. And uh, other researchers found that this perception of discrimination it can be associated with negative externalizing behavior. And we know from a sociological and criminological theories, like labeling theory, that uh, individuals who perceive themselves as dangerous or being discriminated against, or uh, basically anything that uh, negatively affects their self-image might be more likely to engage on social behavior and, uh, uh, engage in crime in general because of that perception. Uh, so another important thing to kind of touch on would be uh, the cumulative disadvantage, which is uh, also related to the assignments that uh, I have basically decided to, to have for you guys for this week. So cumulative disadvantage uh, is a process by which society's responses to an individual's involvement in crime build over time, resulting in limited future opportunities for conventional life. Uh, but this also can be can happen within the criminal justice system across the uh, across several decision points. So uh, the whole idea here is that the decisions uh, that are made earlier. Uh, in, the, in the stage, for example, if someone is being uh, arrested or if someone is more likely to be detained, these are going to affect the, the, the future of the case. So it's going to increase, for example, if someone is being detained, more likely to be convicted, as I, as I explained earlier. And that could also uh, increase the chances of receiving harsher sentences. So, uh, but some of these, again, some of these, um, a disadvantage would be uh, related to, uh, to society and not necessarily the criminal justice system. For example, uh, having um, uh, different uh, opportunities in the society uh, could really affect uh, the life chances of, uh, of racial minorities and kind of increase their uh, chances of being involved in the criminal justice system. So uh, 
Uh, to kind of clarify it a little bit further, uh, let's imagine the, differ the differences uh, between uh, people who go to the public school compared to people who, who go to the private schools. Uh, so people go, uh, working class might be less likely to go to private school. If you go to private school or if you have gone to private school, you probably have received higher education and not only higher education, but you probably were able to develop more critical thinking, uh, thinking skills or problem solving skills that could really help you in different situations. For example, you might be more likely to get a job after you are graduate from, from, uh, from a school or from college because of the, uh, because of the uh, skills that you were able to develop. But also if you look into uh, uh, public schools, not all public schools are going to have uh, similar quality, right? So if you're considering a public school who uh, is located at a disadvantaged neighborhood compared to a public school that is uh, located in the more uh, working class, sorry, uh, middle class neighborhood, perhaps the quality of education is not the same. And uh, it is not only related to the school uh, and education, it could also be related to things outside of the uh, education system. For example, uh, if someone uh, is grown up in a, in a middle class family, they might be more likely to spend their time doing for social activities, right? So you might be more likely to go to the football uh, classes or go to soccer classes and spend your time in more for social way compared to a youth who does not have those opportunities and might end up spending those hours instead of uh, being engaged in some, some form for social activity to hang out with uh, the kids in the neighborhood that might not be very for social. So, this is also referred to as informal social control. So we know from research that, uh, you know, uh, youth who are uh, basically uh, uh, raised in um, disadvantaged neighborhood may not have this informal social control. And this would increase their chances of uh, contact with the justice system in the future. So the whole idea of cumulative disadvantage is that we shouldn't really look into the final case outcome and look into I see whether or not, for example, racial minorities are more likely to be arrested compared to their white, to the white uh, counterparts. First of all, there would be that uh, whole issue with the official data uh, that I explained earlier uh, in this presentation. But also this collection of uh, social factors as well as the criminal justice system actors decision making that is going to cumulatively uh, affect racial minorities uh, much more significantly than any other uh, than compared to whites, for example. So a cumulus disadvantage, again, uh, is to look into not only one stage in the process, but to the entire process throughout the system from the moment that uh, the contact with the justice system is initiated with, the, with, uh, with police uh, until uh, the case is basically um, uh, the, the individual is basically released from uh, being under the supervision of the system. And once that happens, it's also going to affect the, the person's uh, chances of uh, employment, for example, if you have a prior record, right? And so if you were more likely to be detained and more likely to be convicted and more likely to be incarcerated, now it's going to be on your record and it's going to affect your uh, uh, odds of uh, securing uh, employment or uh, engaging in successful marriage, both of which going to uh, affect your tendency to stay in, uh, uh, whether or not to stay in a, a criminal lifestyle. So uh, having these opportunities in life is going to really help individuals to, to turn things around and uh, uh, basically uh, engage in more for social uh, activities that would not initiate the contact with just them again. And again, going back before the contact with the justice system, also uh, um, education opportunities, um, uh, also different uh, social activities that would be, uh, that would make a huge difference between uh, kids growing up in disadvantaged neighborhoods compared to growing up in the middle class, uh, middle class neighborhood. We, we even have evidence uh, in terms of 
food insecurity, for example, things that could start either uh, prior to birth that is going to affect antisocial behavior uh, during adolescence. So we know that and not having access to uh, nutritious food is going to affect antisocial behavior, which could uh, interrupt uh, uh, you know, uh, individuals' engagement in school and also going to increase the odds of um, uh, initiating co contact with the justice system. Perhaps the last thing that I would like to mention here would be that um, given all this limitation we talked about, about the crime data and uh, everything that we know about uh, crime data, there are still some other uh, complications that uh, are, worth, uh, are worth highlighting. For example, if you look at the specific uh, criminal court record, you might find that racial minorities are more likely to receive harsher sentences, but they're also more likely to have dismissal from the, from the system. So at first glance, you might think that, okay, so if racial minorities are being dismissed more than white in criminal courts, they are at advantage, they are not at disadvantage. But the reality is that uh, where researchers explore this possibility of why racial minorities are being uh, uh, dismissed more so than white in, in some uh, studies, they found that, uh, or uh, actually speculated that one of the possibilities would be that they, uh, the, the police officers who make an arrest uh, might not have uh, enough evidence. So uh, basically the arrest may, may not uh, be legitimate. Uh, so when a police officer makes an arrest, the prosecutor office needs to decide on the weight of the evidence and decide whether or not the case worth pursuing. And if the, the prosecutors uh, find out that there is not enough substantial evidence to basically successfully pr prosecute the case, they might dismiss or drop the case. So uh, this also means that uh, uh, if racial minorities are more likely to be arrested, right, the arrest that is made might not be based on uh, legitimate evidence so that the, ca the case cannot be really carried out in, in the system and, and uh, eventually uh, it's dropped. Uh, so as I said, this, this might be more of a speculation, but we do have data and empirical evidence to support similar situations. For example, one study that again I assigned to this week as, as a recommended reading uh, found that uh, racial minorities are more likely to receive harsher sentences, they're all, but they're also less likely to receive rehabilitative uh, interventions. So uh, this also at first glance might look like it's not a bad Bad thing, right? So, so many white uh, uh, youth uh, who had a, who had a history of delinquency might be uh, receiving um, uh, rehabilitation services, while racial minorities are uh, being informally uh, processed in the system and not receiving these rehabilitative services. Well, the the fact is that. Uh, having rehabilitated services or delivering rehabilitated services uh, requires substantial resources. So uh, the fact that many white uh, youth might receive these services, but uh, racial minorities might not benefit from these services is not necessarily a good thing. It means that the system basically fails to provide the services that uh, the general public perhaps seems uh, uh, essential in order to, uh, to prevent them from future antisocial behavior and uh, uh, repeated contact with the system. So these are the things that uh, are really difficult to, uh, to see in data if you're only looking at the, 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 uh, the final result of the studies and not really exploring what is actually going on. And uh, there are limited uh, studies that uh, investigate this uh, as carefully as these two examples that I have here, but these two kind of shed light on some of the possibilities that um, racial minorities might be at disadvantage in uh, this criminal justice system uh, uh, practices as well. So to summarize this, uh, uh, this presentation, uh, we kind of uh, 
uh, hopefully I was able to explain a little bit, maybe not clarify, but explain a little bit some of these co complications associated with studying race and crime or race and criminal justice. Uh, uh, we kind of uh, reviewed very briefly some of the limitations associated with official data which really shape our understanding about the um, uh, relationship between uh, race and crime. Um, and how uh, this uh, issue of categorizing uh, race and ethnicity appropriately is really affecting our understanding of what is actually going on and what is the real picture of race in the United States. Another thing that I kind of mentioned here was the cumulative disadvantage, which is not focusing only one stage in the criminal process, but looking at the whole picture uh, starting very early in life and life opportunities which could lead to the contact with the justice system and those contacts, how it's going to the decision points in criminal justice system a process from uh, making arrest to detention to conviction to sentencing and beyond incarceration, for example, could uh, uh, affect each other from earlier stages to later stages. And uh, not everything is done there, right? Because if you are released from uh, from uh, the supervision of the system and you're considered a free man, your uh, past, your criminal record is going to still influence your your uh, life opportunities. The other thing that I kind of touched on was uh, the uh, importance of considering the uh, combinations of race with uh, sex and age. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, research suggests that repeatedly suggests that uh, uh, being a young African American male is a costly combination when it comes to contact with the justice system. Uh, and um, many of these, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned here, might be related to a stereotyping. And uh, basically, several uh, several uh, theoretical framework has been offered, including a conflict theory or focal concerns theory that basically uh, explains how the conflict theory, for example, explains how uh, uh, certain criminal justice system policies and laws might uh, benefit certain individuals that might be more powerful and elite at the disadvantage of those with less power. Uh, and the focal concerns theory basically explains that how uh, perceived dangerousness of certain individuals and blameworthiness of individuals for committing certain crimes might uh, really contribute to stereotyping and uh, resulting in the in the uh, study finding that we just reviewed together, uh, meaning that being young African American males receive the harsher sentences. And lastly, we kind of touched on uh, careful uh, investigations when we are uh, interested in understanding the impact of race in the criminal justice system, because many, many times maybe we look at the case dismissal or uh, not receiving uh, or being dropped in the criminal justice system or criminal justice system process and consider this as a good thing because the, the kid did not go through the system deeply, but uh, there might be a, these, these events might be due to a lack of uh, sufficient evidence uh, as well as uh, might be related to limitations of the system in order to invest the re its resources on uh, vulnerable populations. And uh, also I kind of tried to uh, explain the differences between racial uh, disparity and uh, how it could be related to systematic or uh, discriminatory practices as well as non-systematic, which well, was related more to stereotyping. So hopefully this provided some uh, explanation or clarification in some instances at least for, uh, for, for you guys. I, I, it's a very important topic uh, and race does really matter in social science uh, in general and particularly in studying criminal justice. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Feel free to email me. I'll be happy to share more resources for those of you who more, might be more interested to, to learn about this topic. Thank you for having me.